We now go to the second session, which is on the whole of society approaches to countering terrorist narratives and incitement. In this session, I would like to first give the floor to Mr. Atif Rashid, journalist who worked for a change of heart podcast, UNOCT, UNCCT, UNAOC, Empowering Dialogue and Interfaith Networks Project. Sir, the floor is yours. You can press it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, the most gracious, ever merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute honor and privilege to be able to speak with you today. I'm extremely grateful to have been invited here among such esteemed members to share my thoughts and experiences on this very important topic which affects us all. I speak not only as a journalist, but also as a young person of faith. I grew up watching people similar to my age being drawn into the traps of extremists like Daesh. I witnessed as the media branded Islam and Muslims as terrorists after 9-11. I stood in horror as I heard the false and perverted image of my religion being used to justify the most heinous crimes. This is also a large part of why I became a journalist. And this is why when I started a podcast with the UN's Eden Project, I wanted to hear the stories of reformed extremists. Every person we interviewed told us very similar things. They were frustrated with the world. They felt their identity was under threat and they had never actually met anyone from the group that they hated. The only reason they hated them was because of what they had been told, either by other people or by what they had seen in the media. Alex was one of the people we spoke to. He grew up in Texas thinking that all Muslims lived in the Middle East and were extremists. He had never met a Muslim. Alex moved to Singapore as part of a student exchange program and lived with a Muslim family during Ramadan, observing their kindness, devotion, and commitment, he said. He noticed that in Singapore, schools have cultural education days, so students learn about other cultures. And it has an ethnic integration policy, which places quotas on how many residents of one racial group can live in an area. This ensures you're always in contact with people of other cultures and backgrounds. Now, I don't want to give away everything from the podcast, so you'll have to listen to the rest on the way home. But the reason we did a podcast is because this is how to reach young people today. They are not watching TV or listening to the radio. They are on Instagram, Spotify, and iTunes. You have to go where they are. Content today has to be made for mobile phones, not TV shows. The thing Eden got right was that it empowered us to create campaigns and messages. The messages didn't come from the UN or official institutions because people are more willing to listen to others like themselves rather than, and I beg you to forgive me, people in suits and ties and politicians and law enforcement and official figures. The messenger is just as important as the message. I've often debated with my editors about giving airtime to extremists. It makes for an exciting news story, no doubt. And editors say it is better to hear their views and challenge them. Now, I would agree, except when such views are publicly proclaimed, it normalizes them and gives legitimacy to the hate preacher. They are also not sufficiently challenged, as journalists don't usually have the arguments required to rebut claims made against a religion or people who misquote scripture to justify violent actions. This is why the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations and the Office of Counterterrorism Eden Program was so important and useful because it brought together faith leaders and media makers to learn from each other. Often faith leaders don't have the media skills to get their positive messages across on social media and media makers don't have the religious knowledge or understanding to sufficiently challenge extremists. A quote I heard in a speech by a religious leader a few years ago has stayed with me ever since. The head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad said, let it not be that in the, in the name of freedom of speech, 
the peace of the entire world be destroyed. Publicity is the oxygen sustaining most terrorist or extremist groups. I was shocked when an ISIS propaganda video was shared on the Facebook page of my news organization. We have to be responsible in the way we report these events. We can't be seen to be glorifying or giving wall-to-wall -wall coverage of extremist actions. Notoriety is what they're seeking. When a white supremacist killed 50 people at a mosque in Christchurch and streamed it all live on Facebook, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said, don't speak his name, don't show the footage. When I told an editor about this, he replied, but this is what we do, this is our job. We have to tell people what happened and name the people who did it. It seems like a fair point, but we have to look at the bigger picture. Let it not be that in the name of freedom of speech, the peace of the entire world be destroyed. Publicity is the oxygen sustaining most terrorist or extremist groups. I interviewed someone called Yossi who said that when he was a teenage Jewish extremist, he thought that if he was to do something violent, the media would put him on the front page. This is what they want. Let's not give it to them. And this is not about censorship. This is about offering better and more credible alternatives to those of the extremists. If ISIS didn't get the endless coverage it did, would so many Western Muslims have been inspired to join them? There is still anger to this day about foreign wars which were deemed to be unjust and illegal and yet they and the global arms trade continues unabated. Wars have caused havoc and suffering and in turn created extremists who seek revenge by attacking innocent people. It's a cycle of terror. From the outside looking in, it seems as though economy and wealth is more important than peace and morality. A former MI6 officer, Alistair Crook, said, it's not right that on the one hand, some countries are trying to stop terrorism but on the other hand, they arm and train jihadists and collude in terrorism. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because this is, not, this is nothing that you don't already know, but it's just to show that these are the frustrations people still tell me all the time. We live in a global village, and whatever happens in another country affects us wherever we are. And the people who have no other outlet to vent their frustrations, they are the ones who join the extremist groups. Young people care deeply about justice, human rights, and equality, but they're not seeing those in the world. This is why they no longer trust mainstream media and official institutions, including their own governments, and why they then turn to social media where their voices can be heard and taken seriously. It's also where they can be radicalized. I'd like to give the example of the Muslim organization which I belong to called the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, which I made reference to earlier. It has no cases of radicalization despite having branches all across the world. This is because it has consistent messaging and guidance which counters extremism. That means giving a clear alternative to the narratives of terrorists. So things like the true concept of jihad in Islam is primarily a personal spiritual struggle not a violent war. Love and loyalty to one's nation is an important part of your faith. And this is why you will see its flag alongside the British flag or flags of other countries even. Your faith is not in conflict with Western values of freedom and democracy, and you should be grateful to the country you live in for the opportunities it has given you. And these are all backed up by scripture and authentic sources. And messages like these are emphasized and repeated again and again. It also has a youth association at every level with local, regional, and national youth leaders who serve as role models for their youth. And in every one of their meetings, they make a pledge to serve not only their faith, but also their country and nation. They organize and implement events and activities for them so they stay away from other harmful influences. They're engaged in community service from a very young age Things like litter picking, homeless feeding, donating blood, or helping neighbors. Because if you put your blood, sweat, and tears into building and helping a society and your nation, you're not going to want to destroy, vandalize, or sabotage it later on. Young people just want to be heard, involved, and taken seriously. They need opportunities and hope for the future. They don't deserve to see the things they hold dear being publicly attacked, 
mocked and ridiculed day in and day out, whether that's in the media, by politicians, or by the general public. Why should we pour more fuel on an already burning fire? We shouldn't hurt the sentiments of other people. We need to place trust in faith leaders and young people. Collaborate with us and speak to us. Our values are aligned with yours in seeking peace and justice in the world. Whatever state you leave the world in today, we will have to pick up the pieces. We're worried about the wars. We're worried about extremism. We're worried about our future. Because the actions you take today will impact us more than it will impact you. If you leave behind a legacy of responsibility and peace building, then we will remember, honor, and continue your efforts in the future. I have a deep yearning to see peace in our time, as I'm sure we all do. After all, this is why we are here. But we have to be humble and listen to one another and act upon the things we say. I hope and pray that we can all together make this a reality. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for allowing me to share these few thoughts of mine. Thank you. Thank you very much. The United States continues to maintain that the most effective means to counter terrorist or other objectionable speech is not through censorship or repression, but through more speech that promotes tolerance and freedom of expression. Thus, we emphasize the importance of promoting credible alternative narratives as the primary means by which we can undermine and counter terrorist messaging. And by that way, I thank Mr. Rashid and journalists like him for doing just that, and I'll definitely tune into the podcast. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to briefly um, respond to the member from Norway's uh, question about different initiatives and things. I just wanted to echo what uh, Mr. Ahmad al Qasimi said, that I think it's very useful to use um, ex-extremists -ex just to um, learn from their lessons and also to um, be a kind of warning for other people just to show that and tell other people you know, how easy it is to become radicalized and the dangers there because it's a similar scheme to what some countries do where they bring in ex-criminals to schools just to warn about you know, a life of crime and how bad that is. And also uh, uh, the Eden Project I think is very good to maybe implement on national levels as well which is where you bring young faith leaders and young media makers to learn from one another and empower them to uh, build campaigns and learn from one another and, and have collaborations in that way as well. Thank you. I thank you very much.